Hello and welcome to the Getting Started with SpecFlow video series. My name is Bas Dijkstra. In this second video I'm going to show you how to get started with SpecFlow, how to set up your system so you can start using SpecFlow, how to create your first feature and scenario and how to execute it. Before we can start using SpecFlow on our machine we need to set up our development environment. The first thing you need to do is to install an ID. I'm using Visual Studio in this video series, but you could also use another ID such as VS Code or Rider, for example. Now to make working with SpecFlow a little easier, I'm going to show you how to install the SpecFlow extension for Visual Studio. I know that other IDEs have specific extensions or plugins to make working with SpecFlow easier as well. But as I said, I'm using Visual Studio here, so I'm going to show you how it works for that ID. Since the introduction of SpecFlow version 3, the mechanism that SpecFlow uses to generate the executable code from your feature files has changed a little. And if you're using SpecFlow 3, you need to disable the SpecFlow single file generator custom tool. If you don't do this, you might run the risk of SpecFlow not working correctly. And finally, I'm going to show you how to create a new project and add the required NuGet packages, which is all you need to get started using SpecFlow on your machine. Now I'm not going to show you how to download and install Visual Studio or any other IDE. If you want to know how to do that exactly, there's plenty of information on the internet out there that can help you accomplish that. I'm going to start showing you how to install the SpecFlow extension for Visual Studio. So here is my Visual Studio installation. I'm using Visual Studio 2019, but SpecFlow works with any reasonably recent version of Visual Studio. If we open the extensions menu and select manage extensions, you can manage the Visual Studio extensions on your machine. Now, if you go to online and then search for SpecFlow, you'll see that the SpecFlow for Visual Studio 2019 extension is right on top of the list. If you select it, you can then install it just like any other extension that you would. It requires a reboot for Visual Studio. And once that's done and the extension installation has completed, it will be listed in the list of installed extensions, as you can see right here. So the next step is to disable the SpecFlow single file generator custom tool. Again, we need to do this in order to make sure that SpecFlow generates the underlying code for our feature files correctly. You can do this by going to the Tools menu and going to Options. If the SpecFlow extension was installed correctly, you'll see a SpecFlow entry in the list. And if you scroll down, you'll see under Legacy, you see the Enable SpecFlow Single File Generator Custom Tool option. Make sure that the value for that option is equal to false or otherwise SpecFlow might not work correctly. On my machine, it's already set to false, so we don't have to do anything here. The final step before we can get started using SpecFlow is to create a new project in your IDE and add the required packages. So I've already created a C Sharp project here. It's relatively empty. The only thing I've added so far are two empty folders, one where my SpecFlow feature files will go and one where the corresponding executable code in the forms of step definitions will end up. Before we can get started creating feature files and the corresponding step definitions, we need to add a couple of packages to the project. So we go to manage NuGet packages I'm going to browse. The first package I'm going to add is specflow.nunit, which, as the name suggests, contains both specflow itself as well as the nunit unit testing framework. Click install, and this is added to the project. The second package that I'm going to add is the nunit3 test adapter which is a package that's not related to SpecFlow, but it's required to be able to run tests and therefore also SpecFlow feature files from within Visual Studio itself. So we're going to add that one as well. 
And the final package that I'm going to add is specflow.tools.msbuild.generation, which is a package that enables us to automatically generate the code behind the feature files. And the fact that we're installing this one is the reason that we needed to disable the legacy method of generating the code behind the feature files in the previous setup step. So that's it really. Uh, these are all the packages that we need to get started. But of course, before we start writing feature files, we need an application to work with. Our application on the test is the Zippopotamus REST API. It is an API that you can use to retrieve location data for specific country and zip codes. It supports around 60 countries all over the world now. Plenty for us to play around with in these examples. So now I'm going to show you how to create and execute a specflow feature. Now I'm not going to show you how this specific spec flow feature that we're going to turn into executable specifications came into existence. That happened earlier in the BDD process in the first two phases. What I'm going to show you is how to use spec flow to turn an existing feature into executable code. So here's my empty spec flow project again. And the first thing I need to do is to add a new item to the project. I'm going to do it in the features file because the thing that I want to add is a spec, new spec flow feature. Now, if you install the spec flow extension for Visual Studio, you can directly select spec flow from the list and then add a spec flow feature file. Let's give it a meaningful name here. Say retrieve location data and our feature file is automatically added in the right location to our project. Now this auto generated feature and scenario is pretty useless for our zip code API. So let's replace this with a feature and a couple of scenarios that I created beforehand. This feature describes part of the behavior of our Zippopotamus API and more specifically the fact that when you give it an existing country code and zip code, it tells you something about the data that's being returned. Now, the nice thing about SpecFlow is that this feature is immediately executable. So if we go to the test explorer window and we build our project, you'll see that two tests are automatically added to the test explorer. And these two tests represent the two scenarios that are in our feature file. And we can even run all of the tests that are in the view already. So the build succeeded, but two tests have not yet been run. And if we select the first one and we take a closer look at the details, it tells us that there's no matching step definition found for one or more steps. This is spec flow telling us that there's no corresponding executable code yet for the steps that are in our feature file. And in Visual Studio, this is also visible in the feature editor window because all of the steps in the different scenarios are purple. And this is Visual Studio's way or rather the spec flow extension for Visual Studio's way of telling us that there's no associated step definition found yet in the project for the steps that are in our feature file. So the next thing that we need to do is find a way to generate step definitions for the steps in our scenarios that as of yet have no code associated with them yet. The nice thing about spec flow is that it already suggested code snippets that you can use to implement the steps in the feature file. There's also another way to generate step definitions for your step files, and that can be done by right clicking any of the steps for which there's no associated code yet, no step definition yet in the code base, right clicking on it, then say select generate step definitions. Here you see a list of all the steps in the, in the feature file that have no code associated with them yet. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail right now about the various 
options and settings that you can use in this in the generation of these step definitions that will be discussed in the next video let's for now just click the generate button save the generated step definitions into the suggested location this is also the reason why i created a step definitions folder beforehand because specflow will automatically suggest that folder as the location of the generated step definitions which keeps my project nice and organized so now we can see that specflow automatically generated step definitions for us so if we go back to the test explorer build our project again and rerun the tests or rather the scenarios in the feature file. If you do that, you'll still see the blue exclamation mark, but there's a different message now. One or more step definitions are not implemented yet. If we take a closer look at what it is that Specflow actually generated for us, we can see that it, it did successfully generate the step definitions, but in the body of all the methods, all the step definition methods, it put scenario context.current.pending, which is the reason that this message is showing up in our test explorer window. If we remove all of these scenario context.current.pending statements, build our project again, and again using the test explorer run all of the features, run all of the scenarios in our feature file, we can see that the execution passes now because there's no reason for specflow anymore to throw an error or an exception. In other words, we now have fully functional and working executable specifications. They don't perform meaningful tests yet, but what we've done here is we created a new feature file in our project we specified a feature and two scenarios in there. We executed these scenarios, saw that there were no associated step definitions yet, then used specflow to automatically generate step definitions for us, removed the pending statements, and as a result, we ended up with working executable specifications for our application under test. In the next video in the series, we're going to take a closer look at how Specflow actually knows which code to execute when it encounters a step in a feature file and all the different options you have in creating more powerful and more reusable step definitions. Thank you for watching this video. And if you have any questions or remarks or feedback, please do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you for watching.